we see higher rates of things like heart disease, uh, obesity, diabetes, certain forms of cancer. Uh, in this area, asthma and other respiratory diseases uh, tend to be um, fairly high as well in underserved communities. Welcome to Growing Impact, a podcast by the Institutes of Energy and the Environment at Penn State. Growing Impact explores cutting-edge projects of researchers and scientists who are solving some of the world's most challenging energy and environmental issues. Each project has been funded through an innovative seed grant program that is facilitated through IEE. I'm your host, Kevin Sliman. On this episode of Growing Impact, I speak with Melissa Bopp, an associate professor of kinesiology, whose research looks to understand and promote physical activity in diverse populations and settings. We discuss her Sea Grant project titled Engaging Underserved Communities in Environmental Assessment for Healthy Living, through which she and her colleagues investigate underserved and racially diverse neighborhoods in the Pittsburgh area, specifically the Mon Valley. This is to examine the role of the built and natural environments in influencing physical activity, healthy eating, and air quality. Melissa, welcome to Growing Impact. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here on behalf of myself and my colleagues to discuss our project. Can you provide a summary of your project and give us a flavor of what it is that you're working on? Sure, absolutely. So um, our kind of very basic description of our project is that we are looking to understand the role of the built and natural environment um, uh, on health um, outcomes, health behaviors in underserved communities uh, in Allegheny County. And just for folks who don't know, so could you tell us a little bit of Allegheny County? So that's Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right? That's where the, the main city in there. Is there a way we could describe or talk about the communities that you're focused on? the Mon Valley sitting um, right along the Monhila River. Um, There's a lot of, um, it's a very um, rugged landscape. Uh, So the river kind of winds through the area, very uh, steep hills, steep cliffs and and things like that. Uh, In a lot of small communities that, um, you know, in the 1800s were um, kind of driving the industrial um, revolution here in the United States with Mm -hmm. uh, big steel plants and and things like that. Uh, And um, the communities built up around those uh, steel plants and and other industrial centers and things like that. And uh, then as as things changed uh, throughout the 20th century uh, and economic situations uh, changed and there was a lot of closure of uh, or downsizing of, of plant activity and, and things like that, uh, the communities um, changed and evolved with that. And um, some of the uh, residual effects of, of that had resulted in um, difficult economic situations for some of these communities, and then also um, difficult uh, uh, environments for um, being healthy for the residents of the communities to uh, be healthy and and from a variety of different uh, ways and influences. um, air and water quality opportunities to engage in healthy behaviors and, and things like that um, have all been moderately challenging in, in um, a lot of these areas. You know, as much as you know, we're studying this particular area, um, we're hoping that we can maybe um, shed some light on some things that could be generalizable to other Rust Belt communities that have experienced similar kinds of things um, to uh, help them with the same kinds of struggles that we're um, trying to understand in, in these areas as well. What are environmental assessments and what are you looking for in those assessments? Sure. So um, that's one of the things that we're aiming to do with this project is to conduct environmental assessments uh, throughout the uh, different communities uh, in in the Mon Valley um, to get an understanding of um, what are uh, the strengths of the community in terms of resources available for uh, promoting um, healthy living, and then what are some areas uh, that could be improved upon. And um, we like to use both objective and subjective assessments 
in uh, our approach, uh, we are using uh, for objective assessments, uh, we're doing some GIS uh, analysis where uh, we are doing some mapping to understand where uh, physical resources are located. Uh, for example, we're, uh, we're building some asset maps for physical activity um, across these different communities. So we're documenting where are things like parks, trails, playgrounds, uh, even um, recreational fitness facilities, private fitness facilities, uh, places where people could um, go to be regularly active. And then we're also uh, conducting uh, subjective assessments because uh, we understand that sometimes it doesn't matter what is physically there, but it's a matter of what people perceive there to be. Um, and an example of that is um, sidewalk quality, right? So if we would like to say, hey, you know, go out, go for a walk and, um, you know, in, in your community, we know you have good continuous sidewalks, right? They're three or four feet wide. We can tell by, you know, audit that we would go out and take a look and, and say, you know, the sidewalks in your neighborhood are pretty good. Um, however, if you perceive the sidewalks in your neighborhood to be um, dangerous, cracked, discontinuous, so that you really don't feel like you could safely go for a walk, um, you're less likely to use that. So um, as much as it's important to document physically what is there, it's an important for us to understand um, what the uh, uh, what uh, residents of the communities themselves perceive about their neighborhoods. For your project, could you define what underserved communities are? Sure. So um, when we talk about underserved communities, we're going with um, uh, the idea of uh, health equity and, and we're centered on equity as defined by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So um, we think about uh, race, ethnicity, income, education, uh, even urban rural status um, in Allegheny County itself is a fairly urban county if you look collectively uh, at the whole county, uh, but some of the communities that we're dealing with are a little bit more small town um, mm -hmm. uh, type of thing. And, and um, we are concerned about the disproportionate burden of preventable uh, disease, uh, disability, and, and death. Um, so uh, we know uh, that we see higher rates of things like heart disease, uh, obesity, diabetes, certain forms of cancer. Uh, in this area, asthma and other respiratory diseases uh, tend to be um, fairly high as well um, in uh, underserved communities. Why is it so important to perform these kind of assessments for underserved communities? For uh, many communities, being able to document um, your assets as well as being able to uh, document maybe where you need to improve upon is the first step in being able to advocate for change. Um, so going to a city council meeting or a county commissioner's meeting or things like that and saying, we need more parks and trails in our community. Okay, well, tell me what you have. Well, I don't know what we have. I just feel like we don't have a lot of access. You know, you're not gonna get very far um, with that. But if um, you can uh, present information to decision makers, uh, to legislators, to lawmakers about um, tying a lack of resources to a disproportionately higher rate of uh, um, disease, disability, and death, uh, that should make a more compelling argument. What sure. kind of health benefits come from um, this kind of assessment? It's well documented that there are many lifestyle related uh, diseases out there. So um, things that stem from poor health behaviors, of physical inactivity, poor dietary choices, things like smoking, um, uh, things that we know that are preventable. So heart disease, which is the leading cause of death in the United States, uh, obesity and diabetes, which are closely tied to heart disease, as well as um, uh, many other chronic health outcomes and, and things like that. Uh, so you, when you think about trying to move the needle on major health outcomes, uh, you need to start with what are some of the things that influence those health outcomes and uh, physical activity uh, participation and healthy eating 
um, are some of those particular uh, factors. So, uh, you know, by we hope, you know, obviously this is a very long term um, outcome, you know, it's not something that we would, you know, our project could solve for next year type of thing. This is a, a five to 10 year, maybe we see some small changes type of thing. Um, but, you know, the first um, marker that we would expect to see is um, greater awareness of um, health issues uh, and health behaviors and how the environment can be tied to that. Um, after that, maybe comes improvements in those things, uh, in the resources and the environment that makes it easier for people to be more active and to make healthier food choices. And then down the road from that would maybe see a, a change in um, those preventable uh, lifestyle related diseases. Could you discuss how uh, a team of folks from different disciplines are able to add to this project? Yeah, I think um, I think a multi multi-dimensional problem calls for a multidisciplinary team um, is probably the best way to uh, put that. So um, there are a lot of factors when you start to look at community level health and health outcomes uh, in the environment that um, just go beyond anyone person's level of expertise. So, you know, I'm here in kinesiology and I know a lot about health and I know a lot about uh, health outcomes and how they tie to disease status. And, you know, we can talk about um, physiologic changes, you know, from participating in physical activity and, and things like that. Um, and I know a little bit about the environment and uh, what, what the evidence says, but, you know, I have a uh, collaborator Malika Bose in landscape architecture, uh, who has a background in urban planning and, and uh, design, and um, she understands how communities are laid out uh, and how that can drive human health and human behavior. Um, and then we have uh, Louisa Holmes, who's in uh, geography, who also has this tremendous understanding of um, how to assess the environment uh, and to document things using um, GIS uh, mapping and how the uh, how we can uh, get it. Uh, both the perceived and the actual elements um, uh, of our uh, our end goal of assessing the environment. So, um, and we hope to be able to expand our team um, once we've uh, gained a, a greater understanding of, of the scope of um, uh, issues facing some of these communities. Um, perhaps there's additional people that we need to bring on. So um, I look forward to expanding um, our, our team in the future uh, and um, seeing uh, where this goes. So uh, it's always valuable to sit at a table with people who come at issues from very different angles. Um, I think we have, we maximize our creativity um, and uh, are much more uh, efficient in, in how we um, can attack a problem. What do you hope your project will achieve? As with any community-based participatory uh, project, uh, the first thing that we would like to uh, do is to uh, build relationships uh, throughout the community with different organizations and uh, different stakeholders and, and partners uh, to gain an understanding uh, of the needs and concerns uh, in, in where we can possibly contribute. Um, we have uh, a lot of expertise related to physical activity, uh, healthy eating, and uh, health outcomes. And uh, we want to be sure that we match our expertise to what the concerns are of uh, the community. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, how maybe that ties to existing uh, uh, initiatives that are going on. I know there's a lot of work um, being uh, done right now centered on air quality um, and uh, a lot of uh, negative respiratory uh, health uh, issues that are happening in the area. Um, and we know that there are a lot of other uh, health conditions that are tied to some of those things. So that's an example of where we can see where we can contribute to um, existing uh, uh, projects that are going on. What are the next steps and or future plans when it comes to this project? Anything you can discuss or talk about now? 
Sure. So uh, we're uh, in the uh, process uh, right now of uh, learning and discovering um, a little bit more about our communities and uh, learning about uh, key stakeholders and important organizations that uh, will be important for us to uh, reach out to and, and learn about and get to know uh, in um in the future. And uh, in the spring semester, we're looking forward to conducting some of our um, field work and on the ground uh, data collection, and, and which will hopefully lead to uh, some of the uh, outcomes that we had outlined in our proposal tied to advocacy training and things like that. But I think um, the most important important next steps. Um, we really can't predict right now because I think it really depends on what we learn. Um, I don't want to hypothesize uh, right now on uh, what uh, the communities are going to say in terms of what their needs are. I think that, you know, it would uh, be best for us to learn and then to see next steps and where we can be a valuable resource. Thank you, Melissa, for spending time with us on Growing Impact and discussing your project with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure to speak about the project. You've been listening to Growing Impact, a podcast by the Institutes of Energy and the Environment at Penn State. I've been your host, Kevin Sliman. This has been Season 2, Episode 8. Thank you for listening.